Welcome to the Prepared Protester. Uh, so my name is Emiliano Lemos. I am a clinical herbalist based in Oakland. Um, my practice focuses a lot on trans health and um, cutie pock health. I'm also a collective member in the Bay Area Herbal Response Team, and I am a medical student too. Um, so before we dive in, I do want to um, have a land acknowledgement. All of us who are facilitating this workshop today are on Chichen Yoloni land in, um, in North America in general, right? We all live on stolen land and we all benefit from the legacy of hundreds of years of both you know, stolen land and slave labor. Um, these things are a part of our history, right? They're part of our culture. We don't get to opt out. So instead we get to choose how to show up and be in good relationship with you know, the history that we've inherited. Uh, just like that means showing up for movements for Black lives and Black dignity, that also means showing up for Indigenous struggles. Uh, so we really recommend you contribute financially um, and in other ways to uh, the Indigenous folks uh, who are the rightful inheritors of the land that you live on. In the Bay, that means please pay your Shumi land tax. That's through the Segoriate Land Trust. Uh, we're going to put a link in the chat for that. Um, also, in terms of this event, uh, we do have a $5 to $30 suggested donation with, of course, no one turned away for lack of funds, but all funds raised for this event will go directly to the Oakland Bail Fund and to People's Community Medics. Please donate directly, um, that's to, to Bayheart um, via PayPal, friends and family, or also uh, to me via Venmo, and then I am routing it uh, to the appropriate folks. But I just want to say that if each person in here donated $5, that would be $500 that we'd be giving to these organizations. And that is a really beautiful gift that we're able to give. So thank you so much for your donations. We've already raised quite a bit of money uh, by your all's uh, generosity. Um, moving on, what this workshop is and what this workshop is not. So this workshop is meant to be an accessible introduction to street first aid related to protests. We will be covering quite a bit in the short amount of time we have, but we wanted to present a concise workshop with the basics so that folks can be out there, take care of each other, look out for themselves. Um, and this workshop is not a full street medic training or a full herbal street medic training, which can take like two days to train people on. Um, so, you know, I, I would not uh, encourage folks to leave this workshop and pronounce themselves medics and go out onto the streets. But I do think that you'll be able to offer some helpful skills to your community through this workshop. In terms of our Zoom stuff for today, um, we're both on Zoom and on Facebook Live. On Zoom, please keep yourself muted. Um, if you don't keep yourself muted, then I will probably mute you. Um, and uh, we are recording the video, but we're not going to be recording the chat. So you're welcome to have your camera either on or off if you're in the Zoom knowing that. Um, and then I will also be moderating the chat on the Zoom and the comments on Facebook to collect questions and just provide tech support, whatever else you all need. Um, we'll save most of the questions for the end. We'll, we will have a question and answer period at the end of the workshop. And with that, I want to introduce our uh, presenters and uh, teachers today. So um, our folks today, we have uh, three Bay Heart Collective Herbalists, all of whom are also medicine makers. Um, I'm going to put their websites and social in the chat shortly. Um, but our folks here today are Alokan Orton Chung. Alokan is a community and clinical herbalist, a plant grower, and a street medic for 15 years. Alokan uses they, them pronouns. Alokan wanna give us a wave so we know who is Alokan, great. Stasha um, Stahl has been a clinical herbalist for 11 years and does herbal harm reduction work at the wound care, uh, in terms of wound care, uh, at the curbside care clinic here in East Bay. Stasha uses she or they pronouns. And Sam, oh, Stasha gave us a wave too. <laughs> And then Sam Wise is our last person. Sam Wise can give us a wave that I won't forget. Um, Sam runs a free herbal clinic for the Here at There encampment and has also done street medicing and protest work for the past 10 years. Uh, Sam uses they, them pronouns. So with that, I think Alokan is going to get us started. Can you not unmute yourself? Do I have to unmute you? Um, go ahead and unmute yourself, Alokan. Now you can. 
All right, thank you so much, Miliano. Much appreciation to you, and thank you everyone for being here and your time. So I'm gonna start first by talking about social distancing because um, we are in the middle of a global pandemic and um, I have a lot of people in my life who have um, vulnerable immune systems. And so the way I take care of them when I go out to protest is I practice social distancing. So this advice was passed on to me um, from different nurses I've talked to who are working in COVID wards right now of how, what we can be doing um, to best practice social distancing while we're out in the streets. So the first is wearing an N95 mask if possible. Having a much stronger kind of mask than the um, fabric mask is important to protect yourself from particles. Um, also having a face shield and goggles because what's happening is the particulates from the COVID virus can also be absorbed through the mucous membranes of the eyes. And it's especially cruel that what we're seeing all around the country is tear gas being used on protesters because what's happening is that's creating more coughing and creating eye irritation. And so that directly creates more possibility of transmission. So again, N95 masks or, or stronger and um, a face shield and goggles, some sort of eye protection. Then I have gloves and hand sanitizer that I'm going out with as well. I'm making sure that my hands are always clean. And lastly, I, as an able-bodied person, go out with my bicycle as a tool. Um, so I have my bike both so I can get to and from the protest quickly if I need to, and also because it helps provide space around me. I'm able to use it to you know, block when people start running. I can hold up my bike and have people go around me. Um, but the main thing I'm doing out there as a medic, medic, medic support is trying to keep people calm because it is when we panic and when we run that actually the most injury I've ever seen at protests happens in that moment when people run. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then lastly, a social distance protocol for me trying to do medical support out there is my med kit. It's been prepared very differently. We always have to adapt to what's happening in the streets, never make assumptions. So everything is individually packed for me to be able to give out. So this is a wound care um, pack, for example. These are gloves. You know, I always have my hand sanitizer. This is a bandana in case someone um, needs to bandage something, right? So I can pass out different tools and walk people through how to use them. So that's a little bit on social distancing and we are going to be moving through things quickly because it's a short workshop, but again, questions at the end. Please write down anything um, that you wanna ask us more about. So the next is roles for people at home. It's really important to me to reiterate that everyone has a role in this movement and there's so many ways that we can support, again, from home. So in my pod, as we've worked with what feels most comfortable for people, around um, engaging in protests. We wanna support each other's health. So we have different roles that people can be in who need to stay home for health reasons, um, whether it's mental health, physical health, or that's just what feels most comfortable to them. So some of those roles are legal support. This is incredibly important. And it can be as simple as taking down someone's legal name, their date of birth, um, their emergency contacts, their medical care needs, their address, and keeping a list of everyone who you've agreed to be their legal support clear and written out, and then having the number of your local legal um, support team. So you can look that up. Usually it's the National Lawyers Guild for us here in Oakland, but it'll be different um, state to state, city to city, who is your legal support team. So what happens is if you find out someone you know has been arrested, you already have that information, you call it into your legal hotline, and it's much easier to track that person and keep tabs on them and hopefully bail them out if possible. Again, that's part of why um, this fundraiser today is in part for the Oakland Bail Fund. Um, also, people with cars are really important right now for protests because what can happen is people do get badly injured at protests at times. And I've definitely needed to call on a car support person several times during protests. So what this person does is they're on standby at home with their car, and if someone gets injured and needs to be taken to either a hospital or another place of care, that person will come and meet myself and the person who's injured at an agreed upon location that we you know, connect over a signal or a secure form of communication to come pick that person up and get them to emergency care. Because in a protest situation, ambulances usually are not allowed to come in. Um, and so that's a really important role to have. 
that role is for someone who is open to having someone in their car, which can be an exposed um, risk of exposure to COVID. So that needs to be agreed upon beforehand. And what we do in our pod is if someone is potentially exposed to other people, is we have a system around self-quarantining and getting tested because we have access to free tests in Oakland. Um, and we do our best to support that person should that time come with taking care of them by delivering food and making sure that they're okay um, while they're self-quarantining. So we plan ahead and we really make sure we have a lot of systems to take care of each other. And a last role for people who are at home, which has been really important to me going out to protest is dispatch. So a person can be at home um, doing dispatch for a team of folks who go out. So let's say you and your friends are going out to a protest and you have a friend who um, wants to stay home. You can give your friend everyone's information who is out and you agree upon what kinds of things you want your team to be updated on. So let's say you go to a protest and the marches split and divide and you ask your dispatch person to send in information about where the marches are ending up. Um, so that person would be following trusted media sources and then texting that information back out to the group so that you don't have to be in the middle of a protest trying to get cell phone service. A lot of times at protests too, they do cut cell phone service, um, especially around the police departments. So there's a lot of different ways people can support um, and it's really, really great and important, I think, to make sure that people don't feel isolated because they can't be going out to protest in the street. Um, and all of us working together makes our movement stronger. So then the last thing I want to talk about is before going out to protest is getting grounded. So again, this is a really, really essential piece to um, taking care of your health is making sure that you're not causing more harm. And the way we do that is by really being centered. The more calm we can be, the more support we can give to ourselves and other people around us and keep people safe. So the plant I work with most around getting grounded is chamomile. So to me, it's really great to choose one plant that you can really build a deep relationship with and trust. And we'll be talking about um, some folks who teach classes at the end of um, our presentation that we can re recommend for you to learn more about the plants. But for me, my main squeeze is chamomile. It's a really incredible plant for acute anxiety. It's one of the um, number one plants I work with for panic attacks. So for me, before I go out to a protest, you know, I have my chamomile tincture and I um, have a few dropper fulls. It's a tiny dropper full because I'm almost out right now. Um, and then I get grounded, set some intentions before going out. Um, and the other things that help besides just working with a plant to soothe your nervous system is also making sure you're hydrated. This is a really important part. Um, making sure you're hydrated so that your, your mucous membranes are being taken care of as you go out into the street. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Trying to get good sleep. This is very hard right now for a lot of people. Um, chamomile is an excellent herb for helping with sleep. Drinking a strong cup of tea an hour before bed so you have time to pee before you fall asleep is really good. Um, and then having immune support herbs because this is a stressful time. There's a lot of um, heightened anxiety. There's a lot of heightened trauma happening. So being able to work with herbs that are taking care of your immune system um, during this time, especially when there's this pandemic. Um, so I work most with reishi. So reishi is a medicinal mushroom. It's really beautiful right here. Um, and I work with the powder and I have it as a tincture or having it in soup. It's very bitter. Um, having that daily as a deep immune tonic to protect my immune system. And then I do have the tea of echinacea and elderberry. Um, I have that every day, but that's because I'm feeling well. If you start to feel unhealthy um, in terms of your feeling like you're having symptoms of getting sick, an acute cold or flu, you would not take echinacea and elderberry at that time because they have been found to possibly exacerbate um, COVID itself. But taking it preventatively daily is a really good um, tea. So again, that's echinacea and elderberry tea and then reishi mushroom um, as an immune protectant. So I'm going to pass it over to Sam, who will talk more about what happens during a protest. Thank you, Alokan. 
Nice to see everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what you might encounter at a protest um, in these times and some useful things that help us um, take care of one another. Um, something that we've been doing is putting together kits for folks to give out um, so that more folks are empowered with the tools to support themselves in their pod um, in the event of tear gas or other police weapons. So I'm going to walk you through um, a kit that we've been making for folks um, so that you know some things that are helping us. Um, the big one that we're seeing a lot is tear gas and I'm going to talk a lot about um, how to flush someone's eyes who's been exposed to tear gas, um, but the best tool that I've seen so far is a squeezy bottle filled with water. Um, there's some debate around um, whether, like what else to include in a flush for tear gas, and um, water is totally fine. Um, you could use like a little bit of milk of magnesia that is unflavored. Um, it's like an antacid and that can support a little bit. A little bit goes a long way. You can dilute that into um, a water bottle like this um, or you could not and just have the, the fresh water and be able to use that for other purposes like flushing, um, flushing a wound as well. So that's a useful tool. Um, we also have um, some, there's some bandages here in case of scrapes or cuts um, and also earplugs for um, encountering sound weapons like an LRAD, um, which can be very severely damaging of your ear. Um, we also have some ibuprofen, which is harder to see um, for folks who have been hit with uh, rubber or wooden bullets, which can leave some pretty nasty um, bruises, or another word for that is contusion. And then we have extra masks in our kits. Um, if you were wearing something like this or a cloth mask while tear gas is being dispersed, then that mask is then unusable. Um, it like still carries the irritant chemical in it. So it's helpful to have some extras on hand. Um, we also have um, cold packs that are activated by movement or crushing. So if I was outside um, and needed to use this for um, bruising, like from a rubber or wooden bullet, um, and I would either step on this or crush it, shake it up, and that's my cold pack. Um, you can also fill your water bottle with a little bit of ice and double that as a cold pack as well, depending on um, the general temperature around you, if that's gonna be comfortable for someone to be flushing their eyes with as well. Gloves are really helpful, lots and lots of gloves so you can um, change them out. Um, even the really strong ones will rip eventually, so keeping an eye on that. Uh, ace bandage, um, that um, if you don't know how to use one of these, I suggest checking out some YouTube videos for how to safely wrap a joint that's been injured. Um, and more, mainly I think of these for like sprains or like, um, strains, um, something that's kind of more on the low key side of things. Um, and then we also have some, so I keep my milk of magnesia in like a little spray top bottle. So um, if I feel like it's called for, if the person I'm working with wants it, then I can do a spritz of the milk of magnesia and then flush out their eyes with the, with the um, water. And then something else that I'll talk a little bit more about is again, our friend chamomile in a spray top bottle with some flower essences. It's really, really helpful to ground myself and to also ground other people who are desiring of that. It's helpful for shock, especially. And it's delicious. I like to do chamomile in, um, in an oximal, so apple cider vinegar uh, tincture with honey. Um, is really, really delicious. So um, I'm gonna turn us around and talk about um, flushing the eyes when you've encountered tear gas, which can be pretty uncomfortable. Um, an important note here is to, if you wear contacts um, and have the option of wearing glasses, 
please wear glasses. Um, that's going to be really helpful because the tear gas can get stuck under the contacts. So um, wear glasses. And so I'm going to turn this around. And we're going to do a quick little demo with my partner, Seed, who has graciously allowed us to flush their eyes. Because, <laughs> um, yeah, one thing that I've learned um, is that it's really helpful to, like, see this process just because the person can startle a little bit with the water um so it's nice to just be able to to have a um a demo so when you're um flushing someone's eyes uh it's helpful to try to go from the inside of the eye out um so you're trying to get the the water and the chemical to to leave their the space of their eyes um, you always want to ask someone's consent before you're doing anything. <laughs> um, but especially for supporting people who have been injured. Um, and then you always want to let folks know that it's best to change their clothes as soon as they can. Um, and yeah, if people can have a change of clothes on hand at a process, that's good. And then they can put like the, their clothes, their used clothes into a, a plastic bag that you would take with you. Um, yeah, so let's say we've encountered some tear gas, it stings really bad. If I'm like being subjected to tear gas as well and I don't have a mask on me, make sure you treat yourself first if you can. Um, it's very difficult to be of support to someone if you're also in screaming pain. So in the case that I'm okay but someone else is just tear gassed, I would say, hey, I see you've been tear gassed. Um, I have some water to flush out your eyes. Is it okay if I flush out your eyes with this water? And they're nodding yes, so I'm yes. like, okay, great. <laughs> um, so I have my water bottle. I'm gonna test it to make sure that it works. It works. <laughs> so I'm gonna ask them to lean your head back a little bit, and then I'm gonna flush out their eyes. Yeah, they're gonna startle a little bit. Um, and it's like, is that better? Yeah. yeah, is it in your mouth too? It is. In okay, mouth. can I flush out your mouth? Okay, spit, spit, and then in our house, you're gonna spit in our house. Okay, thanks. Okay. <laughs> and that's basically how you flush someone's eyes. Um, oh, yeah, so the leaning one. This is something that Alokan taught Seed recently, so we're gonna, we're gonna say thanks, Alokan. Um, because if you, it's helpful to have someone kneeling so that, you, like, either kneeling with their head back or leaning, like we're gonna demonstrate right now. So somebody else, this would take three people. Um, so the person, I, do you want to be the eye person? So if you had it in your eyes and I was wanting to support you, I would have you turn and I would have you lean backwards into me, lean like with your weight. And then somebody having else. someone else going and spray. Can you see that? Did that cut out? Okay, you saw it, great. Okay. Thanks, Seed. <sighs> okay. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what we've been seeing the most of is liberal use of tear gas. Um, and again, varying uh, schools of thought on what is a useful wash, but can't go wrong with water. Um, and that's what I've seen in my direct experience been the most helpful. Um, yeah, some other stuff that we've seen is um, contusions or really nasty bruising from rubber and wooden bullets, um, which if you haven't encountered those are very large items, projectiles, that are actually pretty dangerous. Um, that's why they call them less lethal weapons, is because they can, they, can um, they can still kill folks. So that's why a lot of people protect their heads um, with helmets. Um, and other projectiles like the tear gas canisters themselves so it can also be very dangerous um, and it's another reason why um, cultivating like a sense of awareness about um, is, as much as you can because sometimes you cannot um, where the police are like firing from and if there is like a line like a skirmish line of like protesters and police like kind of being aware of like where that um, those projectiles might be coming from and if you um, choose to be closer to that, um, to support yourself in getting some more training about how to protect your body when you're in those spaces. Um, there's a bunch of great, um, more in-depth, uh, street medic trainings that are out in the world right now. And I encourage, and we're also going to share some resources with you to, to learn more, um, and find out more information. Um, 
so suffice it to say right now, um, if you do encounter um, a rub or like a rubber bullet or a wooden bullet contusion, um, there's some things to, to, to check for um, to see if it's something that you want to refer to more um, to like hospital care or like a higher level of care. Um, so some of those things are like if someone has been hit in the head or the chest, you want to be really careful. Um, and um, usually that would be a, an indication to get some more, um, some more care. Also, um, if they are vomiting or can't move their extremity that they've been hit in, that's kind of like looking for a break. Um, if they scream in pain, if you like when they try to move, and again, you're encouraging people to try to move themselves and not necessarily moving them um, for them. Um, if the bump grows really quickly, like and the bruise has swelling, that's going to happen with a contusion. Um, if it grows really fast, that's an indication that um, there's potentially like a break in a vessel. Um, so one way to um, track that is either to take a picture with your phone or, or whatever, or to make an outline with a Sharpie, like, and then track um, like how big it is over time, like by marking it with the Sharpie. Um, and another thing you want to watch for is if um, it changes quick, like colors really quickly, or there's a lack of sensation further away from the injury. So distally is a, the word we sometimes use in medical realms. But basically, if like I'm hit here, and then I start having less feeling here, that's an indication there might be swelling or something that's affecting the nerves. So again, all of those are um, indications to, to get more care to figure out what's happening. In the absence of those, um, if you get hit with a rubber bullet in it or if someone else gets hit with a rubber bullet or a wooden bullet and it's a really nasty bruise but it seems like they might be okay at home, um, definitely still keep an eye on it um, and some things that you can do to support them are getting them some anti-inflammatories um, like ibuprofen is helpful to have out in the field. People some usually not always but usually know what that is and feel open to taking it unless if there's contraindications that they know about you always want to ask um and then some plants that are helpful for really really nasty bruising are yarrow and arnica which make a nice liniment spray so liniment is like a alcohol tincture in a spray a spray it doesn't have to be in a spray top but it's something that you apply to the skin itself um, so you can spray that on the bruise or contusion itself. Um, and then you can also take some homeopathic arnica um, or low dose um, physical arnica, but I'd stick to the homeopathic if you're not used to doing low dose um, plants. Um, make sure to learn more about that if that's where you're gonna go. Um, so yeah, and then icing, elevating, um, and resting are really um, big if you've been, um, if someone's been hit with a rubber bullet. Um, yeah, some other things that we're seeing that um, Stasha is gonna talk more about are cuts, particularly like from glass or like, um, yeah, some other like, um, like more open wounds, um, which very briefly you would like flush and then support and closing. Um, we're not gonna go into super detail with that today because wound care is like is its own realm, um, but we're gonna touch a little briefly on it. And then, yeah, just briefly really talking about the power of um, essence sprays. Um, that has been something that has been really helpful for me, um, especially in like de-escalating situations um, that are tense. So an essence spray, again, um, what I like to use is the chamomile. So that's the base, like the physical base of chamomile um, in an oximal. So apple cider vinegar, chamomile, honey. Um, and then I'm adding in some essences that are really helpful with shock and trauma um, and like PTSD that come up for folks um, that can be reactivated with this kind of intense energy. So, um, and if you're not familiar with essences, essentially they're um, the energetic imprint of the plant and then that is preserved in some kind of liquid, usually like water and brandy or also vinegar. And some useful ones that I've found are coral bean. And again, like 
you can use these or not. Um, it's really about what's accessible for you. This is just like a formula that I've been using that's been helpful. And ultimately like the chamomile by itself is enough. Um, so coral bean is helpful for PTSD. Mimulus is helpful for fear. Rock Rose is about really big fear. Um, Star of Bethlehem is about shock. If you've been hit with something, it can be quite shocking. Um, Pasque Flower is really helpful for um, panic attacks. So that's something that you could use with other people. Um, asking their permission, being like, hi, I have some, you know, some herbs, some chamomile, a spray that's helpful for um, coming down from shock. Would you like that? It's made of this. Or you can use it on yourself and have your energy radiate out, um, which sometimes I find to be like the most helpful of like this person and this other person who are getting in a fight right now because the energy is so peaked aren't going to necessarily want to take like a, <laughs> a chamomile spray, but I can take the chamomile spray and I can feel grounded, and then I can go stand next to them and, and let my energy um, touch their energy. And that can be a really useful tool for de-escalating or, or helping ameliorate their situation. So those are some of the things that I found to be really helpful um, out in the street right now. Um, again, things change. Um, so taking leadership from folks of color, taking leadership from, um, and just like taking noticing from how things might be shifting or changing is going to be really helpful for deciding what is in your kit and how you want to support yourself and your folks. So I'm going to pass it over to Stasha, who's going to talk a little bit more about the context um, that we're swimming in. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, Sam. Thank you, Alokin. Um, so I'm just gonna briefly talk on, about adaptogens, which are helpful before, during, and after um, moments of um, elevated stress. So um, we are send, we're gonna include some um, links to resources and there'll be more inf information about each of these, but briefly adaptogens help our body um, deal with stress. Um, and it should be said that stress is a normal part of um, our lives. We can't avoid it, um, but sometimes prolonged stress can lead to long-term health um, conditions. So um, using immune adaptogens like um, Alokin mentioned reishi or astragalus, um, then calming adaptogens like ashwagandha or holy basil. Um, and just to remember that we will be um, likely operating um, on a lot of adrenaline and cortisol. Um, and so trying to keep ourselves um, uh, regulated in that way. Another uh, helpful um, herb there is um, milky oat seed. Um, and we're again highlighting things that have fewer contraindications, um, which means in negative interactions um, with uh, prescription medications. Um, okay, so I will talk briefly more about some um, herbs at the end, but I want to go into um, state repression as a community health issue. So um, there's a lot to cover with this, and I'm just going to talk um, bullet point style. So um, repression aims to squash dissent through various means. Um, it removes people from our communities um, and puts them through the criminal justice system. Um, so I'm going to focus on repression that occurs in protests. So we've talked already about physical weapons like tear gas, um, rubber bullets, and tasers. Um, there's also arrests. Um, so you could be arrested or you could witness arrest, right? Um, so before you go out, um, make sure that you have a clear intention of why you're going to the protest. What are you going to do in the protest? What is your reason for being there? Um, that can serve as a guiding um, principle um, throughout that moment and also in the future. Um, so that, you know, 
you want to um, be clear about what will what laws you're willing to break or not right so be clear with yourself um, that can be as simple as staying at a protest that is uh, declared an unlawful assembly um, or it can be other activities so no matter what you should consider that beforehand um, and possibly with the help of grounding herbs um, that we've mentioned or that you can find in the resources um, next, you should um, familiarize yourself with your rights. Um, there are many resources for this, um, we'll include some. Um, it's important to remember that we are creating a culture against the criminal justice system. So familiarize yourself with security culture. Um, for example, when witnessing an arrest or being arrested, don't talk about illegal things you've seen. In fact, never talk about illegal things you've seen. Um, and quite obviously, do not talk to the police. Um, don't try to reason with them. Don't talk to them. Um, if you are arrested, the only thing you need to say are your name and I am going to remain silent. I want to speak with a lawyer. You may have to reiterate that um, both to uh, remind yourself and remind them um, so that you can practice saying that aloud um, in the mirror if you need to. Um, and again, once you understand your intentions, as Loken mentioned, um, it's important to um, write your local NLG number or legal support group number on your body in a non-visible location um, so that you can find it, but it's not necessarily uh, alerting uh, your arresters. So, um, and then just one thing I wanna say is that um, we do need medics, but, uh, please don't be a, become a medic out of a desire for safety. Uh, being a medic comes with risk. Um, you may be arrested, you may be charged, um, and then you may have the uh, weapons uh, against you, right? So just to remember that oftentimes being a medic uh, means going into danger to remove someone from danger um, or from harm, I should say. So during the protest, um, there's some safety, health, or legal considerations. Um, so just beware of an unsteady state of mind. That's both individual and collective. So um, as Sam and Alokan both said, you can consider flower essences like um, yarrow, rescue remedy, or grounding herbs, um, skullcap, lavender um, are some examples. Um, so trying the best you can to stay calm. Um, there's no need to run if you're not being chased. Um, running increases the risk of injury, um, increases the state of anxiety in people around you, um, and can leave people behind and at risk. Um, walk quickly if you feel that you need to get away. Um, come back to your breath and reorient to your surroundings. There's, um, I've been seeing um, links to um, grounding exercises or somatic exercises for um, moments of increased anxiety or panic when you're um, in a protest situation. Um, I'm not sure if we link to those, but we can maybe do that on the website later. Um, another thing to consider is that people may protest in different ways than you feel comfortable with, um, and there may be a desire to intervene. Um, I think it is important to carefully consider the risk involved before intervening. Um, people have been seriously injured for trying to stop someone from protesting in diverse ways. Um, so uh, just keep that in mind. Um, and I just want to reiterate that um, repression is a community health issue. So we want to maintain the safety and integrity of resistance networks, um, which for this reason, don't film people um, and don't put people's faces on social media. Um, don't put, maybe don't put um, anything that you observe. You want to keep filming um, to the police um, and their activities. Um, you want to keep people's Face, you want to keep people who are protesting faces away from the police and others who may dox them or otherwise cause harm, right? Um, and also just remember that Instagram works with the federal government. Facebook works with the federal government. They will hand over your information. And so in, if you are posting these things, you are essentially handing them over to the state. So just a reminder to please don't snitch on yourself or other people by posting a 
illegal activities on Instagram. Um, okay, so if you witness an injury and try to help, please understand your scope of practice. So um, learn to identify uh, when someone needs hospital care. So as Sam talked about, um, and know when to call on the cars that are ready, as Loken mentioned, um, to drive people to hospital um, to, or other locations uh, where a temporary clinic is set up. If a person can't or won't go to the hospital for um, legal or immigration or immigrant status reasons. So it's important to ask if someone can go. Sometimes they have to go, um, but try to give them that option. Um, and in that same vein, like please consider bringing a biohazard bag or a plastic bag to help dispose of biohazards like bloody gloves, clothes, um, etc. Um, these things shouldn't be left behind because of a public health risk. Um, and also they can lead to repression as police pick over scenes to acquire DNA samples and identify individuals. Um, we have all seen probably um, on many times uh, police officers um, causing physical harm to protesters or people going about their daily life. And then those people um, incur assault charges. And so you don't want to hand evidence against this false, um, basically framing. Okay, so moving away from that, um, I um, have about two more minutes, I think. So, um, I just want to say that wounds are common, um, especially glass wounds. Um, so just making sure that you can wipe them off to assess the uh, damage of the wound um, and then have a disinfectant. You can have um, betadine spray, you can make an herbal disinfectant. Um, so um, that's like a wound wash tea that you could spray on things. Um, and since this is a more um, an issue that requires more training, I'm going to just skip over it right now um, and then know that we're going to send links to where you can find more information about that um, or res for resources. Um, but just consider having a hemostat. What that means is it stops bleeding. So a good one on hand um, is yarrow powder or yarrow tincture. Um, and then Alokin is going to talk uh, briefly about um, uh, liver detox. And so I just want to say that um, chemical warfare, uh, like tear gas, um, has long lasting effects. Um, and so detoxification is important. But other things that can affect our liver at protest is smoke from um, burning um, construction items, or I've seen videos of people burning scooters. Those have lithium batteries that are toxic. Um, um, and then also the burning plastic is toxic, right? So um, just focusing on liver support. Um, so uh, one herb that comes to mind is milk thistle. You can eat it or get a, um, you can make a tea or have um, a fluid extract tincture. Um, and you wanna just support liver detox, which Alokin will go into more detail about. Um, but you also wanna support um, lymph movement. Um, so you um, want your blood to be cleaning, um, helping, assisting in the detoxification process. So some herbs to keep in mind for that are cleavers, violet, um, calendula and calendula is also useful as a demulcent and what that means is um, it creates a slimy barrier on your mucosal membranes that um, can help soothe and protect irritated tissue so breathing in smoke um, can dry out that tissue um, and cause inflammation later so um, they serve as anti-inflammatories and also help to dispel toxins so um, hello Ken. thank you all right, thank you both so much. Really appreciate it. I'm gonna just add a little bit more about aftercare. So we do keep talking about the liver and um, being able to cleanse the liver and that's because that's the organ that is helping us detox our system. So when toxins come in, the liver needs to be um, functioning as best it can to clear those toxins out of the body. Um, so milk thistle seed, as um, Sasha mentioned, is a really amazing herb that binds to those chemicals in our bloodstream and pulls them out. Um, so does burdock. Burdock root is really easy to find at a lot of Asian stores too, Asian groceries. Um, it's also known as gobo root. And so burdock root is excellent for that um, and really helps build up and detoxify the blood. 
Um, and then for the lungs, mullein is a great lung herb that you can have. You can have it as a tea. Just make sure that you strain all the little hairs or they can actually irritate more. Um, but also as a steam. So you can put some uh, mullein leaves in a bowl and pour some hot water over it. Let it cool just enough so that you can comfortably put your face over that. Put a towel over your head and breathe that in. And that again, that helps to um, relieve the irritation of the mucosal membranes as Stasha was talking about. Um, and then lastly, supporting your nervous system. And I feel like I am like a walking advertisement for chamomile, but again, it's a very um, accessible herb. And if I were to choose one herb for the rest of my life to work with for all the things, it would be chamomile because it supports the nervous system, helps the liver to detox, promotes um, healthy digestion, which a lot of our digestion can get upset. You know, we were all talking about how um, it's been hard to eat these past couple um, days but it helps promote appetite and um, supports with sleep. It's like all around incredible accessible herb, right? And helps with allergies too. Um, so starting to develop a relationship with one herb at a time and really deeply working with these herbs to support yourself during these, um, you know, during the protests and beyond, it's really important to um, develop these deeper relationships. So in a minute, I'm gonna talk about resources for folks who teach great classes on that. Um, but other things on aftercare is having food prepped before you go out. So when you come home, you can have a nice soup or something like that. Um, because again, eating and keeping your energy up is really important at this time. Um, and then checking on, in on folks, having a buddy system. So whoever you went out with, or if you know other friends or people who've gone to a protest, checking in with each other that night. And then definitely again the next day, because often during, um, and like soon after an action, we have a lot of adrenaline that drops off and the next day can be really hard. So continuing to check in on each other um, and offering each other resources of emotional support. Um, and then lastly, um, just how to continue building these relationships with these plants. You know, we've named a lot of different plants. We named yarrow, calendula, violets. We've talked about flower essences and tinctures. Um, and maybe you've never heard of a flower essence. Maybe you've never heard of a tincture. There's a lot of incredible teachers. I'm going to bring that slide up in a minute um, who can elaborate more on what those are. Um, but to really try to touch the plants, you know, try growing them. Um, there's a lot of plants all around us that are incredible medicinals here in California. We have California poppy is like one of our native plants that's great for the nervous system. Um, burdock grows all around New York City. You know, there's these incredible plants that are here to help us all the time. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um, of I can do it too, Alokin, if you wish. I think I got it, I think so. So I want to uh, share some resources of different herbalists who teach classes. This list is specifically um, centering black herbalists and teachers because I want to center their work and ways for people to um, support them. So it's Bay Area heavy because that's where we are, but a few folks in NYC. And as I share this list, this will be up while we do questions and answers. I do want to say um, to not necessarily reach out for these, to these folks with questions because that's labor um, if you're asking individual questions, but to follow their work and sign up for their classes or sign up for their newsletters um, and enroll in their classes. Um, I'll mention Kanchan Hunter at Spiral Gardens. They sell plants, so you can actually grow these plants yourself. Um, Sacred Vise Apothecary in New York is um, an apothecary where you can buy some of the herbs we've talked about. Harriet's Apothecary in New York is a healing resource and space, and I promote that. Um, I want to support and promote their work, and you can check them out, and they do a lot of events, and I, I encourage you to donate to their work. Um, they do incredible things. So we, I think we're going to open it up for questions now. Lovely. So um, I'll just say a couple quick things as we're opening up for questions. Um, folks can either type questions in to the chat on the Zoom or also um, our Facebook live stream, and they'll be relayed back here. We are recording. So if you'd rather not be recorded with your voice, that's a great way to do it. Or for folks who are here on the Zoom, you're also welcome to just unmute yourself um, and or video if you wish uh, to ask questions. But yeah, we did wanna make sure to have some time for questions uh, given that 
you know, I think that there, you know, is a, there's a lot of need out there. Um, there's also a lot of folks who have uh, good ideas and maybe just need a little bit more clarification around how to actualize an idea, you know, in its totality. So great. Um, I see a question in the chat already. Best places to get the herbs y'all have cited other than foraging slash growing if possible? Um, a lot depends on where you are, but here in California, um, we have uh, Sonoma County Herb Exchange is an incredible resource, and so is Steadfast Farms. These are all growers who grow the herbs. Larger national is Pacific Botanicals. And then again, if you're um, in New York, Sacred Vibes Apothecary is incredible. And then if there's more, please add them in the chats. Um, but those are all farms and growers I know and have been to and trust. And I'll just add on also, um, you know, note on foraging. A lot of us have been trained that um, foraging or um, wild harvesting is actually not an appropriate way to be in relationship with plants um, without having a very, very, very long standing relationship, like years long with, um, with a stand of plants. Um, and that's because it's kind of an extension of, um, of colonization, of colonialism. Um, you know, our idea that we can just go out and take what is there. And often indigenous folks are still also working with stands of plants, even if we don't realize it. Um, and that means we're actually, you know, stealing someone else's labor and effort. So just a note that um, whenever possible, um, buying plants that have been uh, mindfully grown is, is really the best way to do it. Lovely, okay. How do you manage using essences around people with respiratory conditions like asthma? Does somebody who spoke to essences want to speak to that? Samwise, Dasha? Uh, I can, um, I, or if you have something to add, Sam. Um, just that essences have no, um, they don't have to be ingested um, and they don't have to be inhaled. So you can spray it around a person, um, but maybe Sam wants to say something else too. Yeah, in general, essences are really safe um, because they're the, not the physical constituents of the plants. They are the energetic imprint preserved in water and brandy or another liquid. Um, I wonder if you're asking about how to support someone with asthma specifically, because um, that would be a, an interesting conversation for folks who may be like having their asthmatic symptoms exacerbated by um, these kind of settings. Yeah, I think the point there is primarily that we don't have to do super fragranced stuff um, in terms of like essences and sprays that often they can be pretty low, uh, like fragrance free or the fragrance might be like vinegar, which I think shouldn't really trigger asthma concerns for most people. Okay, um, we have another question. If you do use malox or milk of magnesia, what is a good ratio to water? Also, is there a difference between malox and milk of magnesia? Samwise, you are muted. I was just saying Alokan, <laughs> if you want to take that one. Um, we're doing about a tablespoon um, for like a, a liter. And it is really important to note, like if you do one of those larger bottles, divide that up into much smaller bottles because you don't want to use the same eye wash on multiple people because you could transmit from eye to eye if you're touching things, right? Um, and there's a lot of fluid coming out of people's faces. So because of the pandemic, have small little bottles that you divide that liter up into. And I use them in church. I actually only use Maalox because that's, since I was a wee medic, what I was taught to do. So that's what I use. Thanks for that, y'all. Um, I have a note that in the comment over here, uh, somebody posted a smaller list of herbal growers in the U.S., so I'll post that over to the Facebook in the moment, um, which is a good, good for sourcing. Um, another question we have, do we have a suggestion for a good broth? I wonder if uh, that person could clarify what kind of a broth um, they're looking for. So we'll come back to that question in a sec, like what, kind, what the broth would help with. How about... Um, any tips to best move somebody if they cannot move themselves in order to get car support? I'll 
I'll say it really depends on the situation. If there's any chance of a um, of a spinal injury, you need to the person has to stay there um, to the best that you can, where you would essentially have to create a um, safety zone around them, right? You would be blocking people from um, running or walking up onto them. Um, you want to stabilize their position, right? Um, fortunately like most of what i've encountered where we've had to evacuate people have been um concussions right so they were starting to lose consciousness but we were able to have multiple people like under each arm walking with them out of the danger zone so like a block away usually there's at least you know a corner that you can go down something smaller and then we waited with them trying to keep them awake as uh, the car arrived but um yeah, I, I think consciousness, if a person loses consciousness completely and it's possible to just really hold the space around them, but it's, if it's in the middle of a situation where they, it could cause more harm for them to stay there, having multiple people to carry them out and really stabilizing the neck, right? Because you don't want to have, especially after head injury, you don't want to then add like a neck injury to that. So um, I there's actually a lot of different... Um, ways and positions and like whether it's drags or carries um, that you can do that are a little bit complicated to explain on here. Um, I really encourage folks to get like first aid training that's comprehensive. Like this is a one hour um, trying to cover some basics just so folks feel a little more prepared. But I really encourage folks to look into different things. Um, there's a list that someone we in our um, Greater Collective has compiled, I think Emiliano, you were gonna um, add that list of different first aid trainings that are out there. But I appreciate that question. And again, thinking of scope and safety, um, it will be very situational. But doing your best to um, create less danger in a scene when there's injury is always the most important. So clearing a space around a person, and then if staying there creates more danger, figuring out ways to get them out of that space. Thanks, Logan. Um, I want to name that it's noon right now, and some people may need to head to next things. Um, I think that we're all okay to stay on for several more minutes and keep answering a few questions. But before we do that, I just want to note that we will, we have not yet, but on our website, which is bay, b a y h r t dot weebly dot com, that's the Bay Area Herbal Response Team website. We will have a much more comprehensive list of websites um, and other resources uh, that are have come up over the course of this workshop, and you know the other trainings that Alokan just mentioned, um, et cetera. So, please check out there. Um, we will also be posting a recording of this um, to YouTube and probably Facebook too, um, so that folks who weren't able to be here in person today can access that. And also, just really want to encourage folks if you haven't had a chance to please donate five to thirty dollars. Um, for this workshop, uh, which will go directly to the Oakland uh, Bail Fund and also to uh, People's Community Medics, which is an East Bay based project. Elokin, do you want to say a few words about that project and why they're rad to be supporting? Yeah, East um, People's Community Medics <clears throat> is an incredible group that emerged um, around work after Oscar Grant's murder, and um, it's a Black led organization where essentially people um, coming together to take care of their own communities because the cops um, keep ambulances out after a police shooting is often what happens. Um, they don't provide care to the person who's been shot. So people, community medics have come together to address everything from gunshot wounds to seizures to um, yeah, how to, do, to respond to a huge array of situations. Um, free of the police and keeping it within community. And they're really incredible and really um, encourage you to check out their websites up right here at the top um, to support them and the work that they do. Lovely, thank you. Um, and great, so I'm gonna go back to asking a few more of the questions that folks asked. And you know, again, folks are welcome to stick around if folks need to trickle out, that's totally okay too. Um, and before then, I just also really want to say thank you so much to Stasha and Alokan and Sam, to all of you for sharing so much knowledge with all of us on this call and for continuing to as we ask you some more questions. Um, okay, so there's a question regarding the elderberry and echinacea in regard to acute situations. 
I just wanted to clarify because I've heard otherwise. Also, traditionally, they have been used this way. So does anybody want to speak to the elderberry echinacea question? I know there's, you know, there was some misinformation going on with um, kind of coronavirus and elderberry and echinacea specifically, so. I, I think um, there are varying opinions about it. And I think since this is um, an intro, we're just erring on the side of caution. Um, and so, um, Certainly, echinacea and elderberry have been used um, acutely for forever, um, and they they still can be. Um, but the um, because of COVID and the uncertainty around it, what we're worried about in saying like echinacea and elderberry is an ongoing herb is um, potentially causing um, more inflammation when someone gets sick. So if you start, that's why we said that's why Loken said when um, you start to feel ill. Um, stop um but you can take it before you go out if you're feeling well um it will help as a, a protective immune builder other people will probably have different opinions that's my opinion thanks sasha anyone else want to say anything on elderberry echinacea okay lovely okay um let's see uh boop 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 sorry looking at which other questions we have here um, okay, there was a question about water potentially exacerbating tear gas. Um, and uh, let's see, that question is, I'm getting a little lost in here. I've seen a video circulating made by a former chemical specialist from the military saying that water and water solutions aggravate the tear gas effects more. They recommend letting it dry and trying to have it blow off. What do you all think about that? I, I don't think that's true, um, at least in my experience. It is a powder. Um, it's very painful. Um, so I don't, I don't recommend letting it dry. Um, and it's interesting because it's like degrees of pain, you know, um, like technically that may be true according to this person but what i found is that it is the most relief to be have it be flushed out with plain water or like a little bit of um milk up agnesia like immediately and to get that because it is it does dry as a powder to get that powder off of your skin um and out of your mucosa as soon as possible um i think to try to brush it out would be really hard yeah and to wait would be it does eventually stop stinging but i just don't think folks are going to want to wait that long um and ultimately and like oh who like i kind of like i'm i'm curious about the source of that um and don't know how much i trust the military um but yeah i in my experience it has been best to to flush with water and that that brings relief pretty immediately Thanks for that, Sam. Um, so let's see, a few other questions. First of all, there was a question a little back, a bit back that we didn't get a clarification on that was about um, medicinal broths. And I wonder if that just, um, if we might speak a little bit to medicinal broths and how they can play a role in supporting folks um, in this time. But look, and you're all about that. I am obsessed with medicinal broths and I also recognize I'm talking a lot, so I think I will um, move back for the next questions. But um, I, yeah, medicinal broths I work with every day in some way. So if I'm cooking rice, I cook it in broth. If I'm cooking beans, I cook them in broth. Um, I use broth to steam my greens. Um, and to me, it's just a different way of, um, it's also my people's, my, you know, my Chinese ancestors, their way of how we have worked with the plants forever is to have it in food. Um, and I do have a YouTube channel that talks about making um, uh, reishi broth. It's amazing, it's very bitter, it's intense, but um, yeah, I, it's, uh, I think broths are a really important way. And then from the Chinese medicine perspective, um, actually having wet foods right now, with COVID as a respiratory illness is actually really protecting the mucosal membranes that Stasha has talked about. Um, so having like oatmeals, like wet breakfast, um, uh, congee, things like that, that are all cooked in broth are both a way to get like medicinal herbs into your body and then also um, to protect your mucous membranes. 
Thanks, Alokan. We have a question from the Facebook live stream, which is, do you have any links to best practices about safety, safely producing and distributing herbs at actions in the time of Corona? We do have a resource about safely uh, producing and pouring herbs. Um, do you all have any quick suggestions around distributing herbs at actions and safe ways around, um, you know, coronavirus and trying to maintain social distancing and just best practices as much as possible? Can you repeat the question? I'm so sorry. The question is around um, safely distributing herbs at actions in the time of coronavirus. Um, well, Alokan touched on this a little bit about having individualized um, things, and then Samwise talked about um, having sprays, um, which if they don't make physical contact should be okay. Um, also, medics can wear gloves, we can use hand sanitizer, we're wearing masks, um, and you can disinfect um, your tools um, before you go out and when you come home and if you're out for a long time during. Those would be the suggestions I have off the top of my head. Do y'all have any? Yeah, I would also say, um, like, encourage your community around you to self-empower themselves with herbs that they grow in their gardens or community gardens so that, um, that it, this is my, like, long-term vision, but um, so that herbs in general are, like, more accessible to folks, um, like, in our daily lives so that because sometimes it can be hard to be like here's this tincture of this mystery plant that is now in liquid form that i'm trying to give to you for this specific thing <laughs> um so i would say like one of the best ways that i love to distribute medicine herbal medicines is to to make offerings like this that are um, educational in in its nature um and like broths or things that are like um encouraging folks to have more of that direct relationship that alokan in is speaking to um so that, um, yeah, that's sort of like more of like a grassroots phenomenon of people getting in contact with the vibrant aliveness um, of the resources of plants that grow around us at all times. Um, and that way, uh, like maybe that would be something to do, like, yeah, more like skill sharing around um, in your community so that you're not having to put something into somebody else's hands, but rather like, here's this practice that's working really well for us. Like, um, like I encourage you to do that for your sphere and your realm so that that can continue to grow um, and support our, our communities um, in the future. Thanks, y'all. I think we'll do just a couple more questions and then wrap up. So I um, have a couple of questions about medicines. As medicine makers, what other items would be useful for us to make for front lines? This person loves the chamomile and oxymel flower essence spray and the hemostat powder packs and just wanting to know if there's any other specifics we could prepare to be of service. Um, just, I mean, there's, there's so many things and um, I hesitate to answer. I think that a lot of the resources that are um, that we've included have lists of um, these things. But does any does anyone have something that comes off the top of their head that they want to say? I think detoxing is really important because, as Stasha mentioned and Sam, like the lasting effects of tear gas, if that's being used in your town. Um, so having like a burdock, uh, even just like burdock tea for folks to take home, you know, in tea bags, uh, in a plastic bag individually, right? A few tea bags that folks can just take home. Um, burdock is usually a bit more easy to find, um, or chamomile, uh, but burdock's a little more powerful for the liver for detox or dandelion root as well. Um, those ones are a little bit easier to find out there. And I do want to say because um, there has been a lot of pushback from the medical community about the use of tear gas while there's a respiratory pandemic, um, the cops will switch tactics, right? And so the potential of it becoming pepper spray and then the sound weapons is really high. So I really encourage folks to adapt and watch what the police are doing and um, yeah, I think having uh, the ear 
plugs is really important, especially because they are using the sound grenades anyway um, to protect your ears. Oh, Logan, just out of curiosity, what is your favorite pepper spray protocol? Oh, um, I, yeah, I haven't had to work with pepper spray in a while. Um, I, I think for me, having some sort of, um, the antacids are helpful there too. You know, and actually there's been a lot of really cool things happening out there um, that are new to me. So I want to try some of the new stuff that I haven't learned about. Um, the Sudicon, if folks are familiar with that, that's brand new to me. Because again, like I've worked with the same things for a really long time because that's how I was taught and it's what I've seen work. But I think starting to evolve is really important. So I'm going to try out some new stuff. Thanks, y'all. Okay, I'm gonna do this last question. Um, this question is about harvesting herbs in safe ways. Many people who use herbs up here in what's known as Canada are low income and therefore are dependent on foraging rather than purchasing while building a strong relationship with them so that it's done with respect and ethically. This person is wondering if someone can speak to how to clean herbs gathered in urban areas. Uh, they're always worried about pesticides, dog pee, et cetera. I'll say one thing that a botanist told me once, um, which is that Roundup was basically made to kill dandelions. Um, so if you are in an area and you're seeing dandelions growing, chances are good there isn't pesticide there <laughs> um, and that it's relatively safe. Um, yeah, I am cautious though, you know, this is, and I wasn't teaching today, but hey, I'm talking. Um, I'm cautious about using herbs that are in city spaces and just try to be really, really aware and keep an eye on an area longer term before harvesting from a city space to get a sense of, you know, kind of what is coming through that space. Like, for example, um, I used to live in New York City and sometimes would, was, was back then um, taught that it was okay at times to harvest um, from Prospect Park sometimes. Um, and Prospect Park literally will just like lay down areas full of poison um, to kill rats and you know kind of other pests. And obviously we don't want to be including poisons in our medicines. Um, you know, we don't want poisons in what we're harvesting. Uh, they are required though, New York City Parks is required to put up signage uh, when poison has been put down recently or when they're going to. So it is again, just this like longer term relationship building, kind of feeling out your sense, I think, of whether things feel solid enough and safe enough. So yeah, you know, pest, like uh, poisons for animals are more what I'm concerned about as compared to straight up pesticides. Dog pee, I'm, you know, it's kind of, kind of a bummer, but it's not dangerous to us as humans. And I think doesn't necessarily dilute the medicine. Anything else folks would say on that? Um, yeah, I think, well, in Oakland, um, the city parks, um, like around Lake Merritt are not, they, they don't use pesticides. At least that's what I've heard of folks leading, um, like herb walks around the, um, all around the lake. Um, and I've heard folks, um, talk about the, the ethics of harvesting invasive plants. Um, I'm, thinking of particularly like plantain, um, which is a really useful plant for um, skin irritation and like drawing out poison or like drawing out splinters. And that's one that is an invasive, it's also called white man's footprint. Um, and there's a lot to explore about that plant, about like, yeah, how to be in good relationship with this land as an invader. Um, so yeah, that would be something to explore and see how that uh, fits for you about um, harvesting invasive plants um, in safer areas. Oh, that doesn't include the medians though. The medians in Oakland are quite pesticides, but the, the public parks um, are usually not. Okay, y'all, I think we should call it a morning. Um, just want to thank everybody so much for their participation, for their questions, and also for all of their work and care for our communities in this time and for 
showing up in so many ways to honor Black folks, to stand up for Black folks, and to, you know, demand justice in our country. Uh, really appreciate that folks are learning about ways to care for each other and do this work in the world. Any last comments from any of our teachers right now? I just wanted to shout out my teachers, Karen and Sarah from the Blue Otter School of Herbal Medicine. Um, they are also offering classes right now and encourage folks to check out their work. BlueOtterSchool.com. Oh, sorry, go ahead and look in what? Oh, and thank you to all the plants who are always teaching us. Yeah. Thanks everybody for coming. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks for having everyone. us. Too. Okay, take care y'all and please always feel welcome to reach out to us. Bay Heart provides um, free and low cost consultations urgently to folks who need them, including for folks who are doing all this important protest and rebellion work in this time. We also uh, can provide herbal kits to organizations and pods. So reach out if you need us. Okay, take care everyone.